Hello friends, in this video I will be discussing about the morphology of the different organs which are involved in the amyloidosis then the special stains which are used to demonstrate the amyloid and how to diagnose them. Uh, in my previous videos we have already finished about the classification and what are the types of the amyloid. So coming to the morphology in different types of the amyloidosis different organs are involved. Uh, specifically in all the organs will be involved in the later stages but in the initial stage in certain types of amyloidosis specific organs are only involved like in the primary amyloidosis which is because of the plasma cell proliferations which we see in the plasma cell neoplasms here the most common organs involved are the organs of the thoracic region that is heart and the respiratory tract and we have abdominal organs like the gastrointestinal tract other organs are the peripheral nerve, skin and the tongue. But later on it can involve any organ also. Initially we have these organs are initially most commonly involved these organs. Then we have organs involved uh, in the secondary amyloidosis. Here except the thoracic organs what we have seen in the primary amyloidosis, heart, lung and the GIT, other organs are involved in the secondary amyloidosis like the kidneys, liver, spleen, lymph nodes, adrenals and the thyroid. Here also in the later conditions all the organs can be involved. Then coming to the hereditary amyloidosis we have uh, uh, three types in this. In the familial Mediterranean fever the most common organs involved are the kidneys, blood vessels, spleen, respiratory tract and the liver is uh, the last organ which is involved. Then in the familial amyloidotic neuropathies we have the involvement of the peripheral nerves and autonomic nervous system and in the systemic senile amyloidosis the most common organ involved is the heart. Now coming to the morphology of the organs involved, any organ uh, we have certain uh, similar features. So grossly the organ which is involved may be increased in the size. Either it may be normal or it will be increased in the size. And macroscopically we cannot make, make out the amyloid but the cut section of the organ which is involved, it appears waxy and it has a firm consistency. These are the gross features. Then histologically when we see we have the uh, amyloid deposition in the extracellular region uh, slowly in that begins in between the cells. Extracellular means in between the cells we have the deposition and as the deposition increases it encroaches on the cells and uh, slowly it causes a pressure atrophy on them destroying them. And uh, specifically in the amyloidosis which is associated with the plasma cell proliferation we have perivascular and the vascular deposits of the amyloid. Now coming to the individual organs uh, when we see the kidney the uh, organ can be either of the normal size and the color or it will be decreased in the size. Now why it's decreased is because here in this the blood vessels are most commonly involved. So the deposition of the amyloid occurs in the vessel wall which causes the decrease in the lumen of the vessel. So that causes the ischemia and uh, that causes the infarction of the kidney which causes further uh, decrease in the size of the kidney. So in the amyloidosis of the kidney this is the most common kidney is the most common organ involved and in the amyloidosis of the kidney either the kidney remains normal in the size or it will be shrunken in the size because of the involvement of the blood vessels. Now microscopically when we see the deposition in the glomeruli initially it starts in the glomeruli we have a deposition in the mesangium and also along the basement membrane of the vessels. Initially we have this later on as the deposition increases the deposition of the amyloid it encroaches on the vessel lumen. So the lumen of the vessels it is uh, decreased in the size and later on completely the vessels also disappear and in the last stages the entire glomeruli it is converted into the confluent masses of the amyloid deposits only. So initially we have in the mesangium around the basement membrane of the capillaries later encroaching on the capillaries causing the uh, pressure on the capillaries and decreasing their lumen. Later stages we have completely loss of the blood vessels also entire uh, glomeruli it is sclerosed and it is converted into, uh, uh, into a structure which contains a confluent masses of the amyloid. Now even we see 
the amyloid deposition surrounding the tubules so we have peri these are the tubules we have peritubular deposition of the amyloid and then we have the deposition around the blood vessels also so perivascular also so we have in the uh, kidney we have deposition in the perivascular then we have peritubular and we have in the glomeruli now coming to the spleen spleen is also increased in the size we have a moderate to marked splenomegaly which may weigh up to 800 uh, up to 800 grams and histologically when we see we have two patterns of the amyloid deposition in the spleen so two types of the amyloidosis of the spleen we call it as a sargo spleen or lordaceous spleen so in the sargo spleen why the name sargo spleen is given as sargo means tapoica so grossly when we see the structure of the spleen the cut section it shows numerous small uh, nodules are present which will be resembling the tapoica seeds so that's why this was called as a sargo spleen now why only the small nodules we will be seeing in the spleen is because in this condition we have deposition of the amyloid only in the lymphoid follicles that is in the white pulp so wherever the follicles are there we have the deposition and grossly it appears like a small nodule so that's why the name is given as sargospleen now other another type is the lordaceous spleen now here we have the amyloid deposits which are present in between the sinusoids so, so we have the fusion of the amyloid deposits which creates large map like areas now grossly when we see this the cut section of the spleen it is waxy and fatty which will be resembling the lard lard means the pork abdominal fat the abdominal fat of the uh, pork what they use this appearance it resembles this uh, that's why they called it as a lardaceous spleen because it's so waxy and the fatty which is resembling the uh, pork abdominal fat this they called it as a lardaceous spleen and microscopically when we see we have a deposition only in between the sinusoids not in the lymphoid follicles like we have seen in the sargo spleen so depending upon uh, which part of the spleen the deposition is occurring the type of the amyloidosis it varies if it occurs in the white pulp then it uh, gives a sargo spleen if it occurs in the red pulp in between the sinusoids it gives rise to the lordaceous spleen now coming to the liver the deposition can be in apparent or there can be uh, like the spleen only there can be moderate to marked hepatomegaly and microscopically when we see we have the deposits in the space of the tissue just below the endothelium and in between the hepatocytes we have a space of the tissue where we have the deposition of the amyloid so as the deposition increases it slowly encroaches on the adjacent hepatic parenchymal cells and sinusoids so again we have the pressure atrophy so we have the atrophic hepatocytes and later on the entire uh, hepatic parenchyma it will be replaced only by the amyloid deposits but here in this condition the liver function usually is preserved in the amyloidosis now when we see the heart usually it is asymptomatic or uh, the organ is usually normal or it will be enlarged when we this is a normal heart when we see the deposition of the amyloid in the wall of the heart the uh, wall is thickened and cut section is waxy again so when the thickness of the wall is increasing obviously the lumen of the uh, chambers of the heart they decrease and the deposition we see either the subendocardial accumulations or it will be within the myocardium so when it occurs uh, in the myocardium in between the myocardiocytes slowly it again causes the pressure atrophy and destruction of the muscle and when it occurs in the subendocardium it causes the conduction damage to the conduction system so this again causes the abnormalities of the ecg now that was the changes in some organs now we will see the special stains what are used to demonstrate the amyloidosis so most commonly used is the congo red 
Now, when we use the Congo red, the amyloid deposits, it takes up the red pink color or we, some people also call it as a salmon pink color. This is on the light microscopy. The same uh, tissue when we see under the polarized microscopy, wherever we have a deposit, it gives an apple green by refrigerants. So in the light microscopy, it gives red pink color, whereas in the polarized microscopy, it gives the apple green by refrigerants. So Congo red was the commonest stain what we are using. The other uh, special stains which can demonstrate the amyloid are the methyl and the crystal violet, which gives a rose pink color. Thioflavin T and S, it exhibits the fluorescence on ultraviolet light. Halcyon blue, it gives a blue green color. And periodic uh, per iodic acid skip stain, that is PAS stain, it gives a pink color to the amyloid. And immunohistochemistry, it is specifically used to demonstrate which type of the amyloid is deposited, whether it is AA amyloid or it is AL amyloid or it is transthyretin. Now, these are all the stains which are used to demonstrate microscopically the amyloid. Then we have, uh, we can also demonstrate grossly if the organ is involved. So if we apply the Lugol's iodine uh, on the part on the organ which we think it's involved with amyloidosis, it imparts mahogany brown color. Then on that, if we again apply the dilute sulfuric acid, if the amyloid is present, it turns to be blue. So the, uh, by this, we can demonstrate amyloidosis macroscopically also. The sites which are commonly used for the diagnosis of the amyloidosis, like from where we take the biopsies, is the mainly it is abdominal fat. This is the easiest one to acquire. Then we then the also do the rectal biopsy. We see the gingival biopsy and also the kidney biopsy. So these are the normal sites for the biopsies to demonstrate the amyloid deposits. Now out of not only just the biopsy, AL amyloidosis typically it can be diagnosed by doing the electrophoresis, serum and the urine protein electrophoresis. And then we can do the bone marrow aspirates because AL amyloidosis we usually see in the plasma cell neoplasms. So when we do the bone marrow aspiration, we can make out the plasma cytosis. And scintigraphy with radio labeled the serum amyloid P component, this is uh, rapid and the specific test which immediately binds to the amyloid deposits. And this also uh, gives a measure for the extent of the amyloidosis, which is helpful for the prognosis of the patient. Now coming to the clinical features. Clinical features, it depends upon which organ is involved in the amyloidosis. If it is the kidney which is involved in that, if completely only the glomeruli are involved, where they are obliterated in sclerosis, the patient will land up in the renal failure and the uremia and the death of the patient occurs. Whereas, uh, specifically, if the tubules, peritubular deposition is more, then the patient will have the proteinuria leading to the nephrotic syndrome. And if the heart is involved, the patient can have a congestive heart failure or he can have a conduction disturbances like the arrhythmia. I told you if there is a subendocardial deposition, the patient will have the conduction disturbances or the patient can also have the constrictive cardiomyopathies. And in case of the involvement of the GIT, the patient can be asymptomatic or if the tongue, the deposition occurs in the tongue, the tongue will be enlarged and uh, inelasticity will be there. And because of this enlargement, it can hamper the speech and the swallowing. If the stomach and the intestines are involved, obviously there will be malabsorption, diarrhea and disturbances in the digestion. And blood vessels, when they are involved, it causes the vascular fragility, so the blood vessels can break up and they cause the bleeding. And another possibility is the AL amyloid, it binds to the factor 10 and inactivates it. So that causes the coagulation disorder which further leads to the bleeding. So coming to the prognostic factors, generalized amyloidosis has a poor prognosis when compared to localized amyloidosis and reactive systemic amyloidosis, the prognosis is somewhat better. And uh, the AL amyloidosis, when we see prognosis is poor in this type of the amyloidosis. When compared to other types of the amyloidosis, AL amyloidosis, it has a poor prognosis and the median survival is two years after the diagnosis of the condition. So that finishes about the morphology. 
Now just we'll see uh, summarize what we have seen. So the morphology of the organs involved and the clinical features. When the kidney is involved, we have uh, in the kidney we have involvement of the glomeruli and the tubules. So mainly the grossly the size of the kidney is reduced because uh, the vessels are involved in the amyloidosis and they cause ischemia of the parenchyma. So the kidney size is reduced along with that in the glomeruli. When we have the involvement of the glomeruli, it leads to renal failure. And if there is a peritubular deposition of the amyloid, that leads to the proteinuria leading to the nephrotic syndrome. When spleen is involved, the spleen is enlarged in the size and we can have two types of the amyloidosis either it can be psycho or it can be laudaceous spleen. Psycho spleen is when we have the deposition typically in the lymphoid follicles that's in the white pulp. Laudaceous spleen is when we have the deposition in between the sinusoids. Then when the liver is involved the liver is enlarged in the size and we have uh, the deposition specifically in the space of the DC and as the deposition increases, it encroaches on the hepatocytes causing destruction of the hepatic parenchyma. When the heart is involved, we have the increased thickness of the wall of the heart. So we have a deposition in the subendocardium and we have deposition in the myocardium. So there will be the myocardial destruction or if it is subendocardium, there will be defect in the conduction mechanism. So the net effect is the patient can have congestive heart failure or he can have conduction disturbances or constrictive cardiomyopathies. When GIT is involved, either it can be asymptomatic or there can be malabsorption, diarrhea and disturbances in the digestion. Blood vessels, that leads to the bleeding disorder because of the vascular fragility or there can be, uh, if it is an AL amyloid, it combines with the factor 10 causing a bleeding disorder. So when we see the common biopsy sites, uh, it is abdominal fat or rectal biopsy or gingival biopsy or the kidney biopsy. And uh, when we come to the special stains, grossly amyloid can be uh, demonstrated by using the Lugol's iodine, which gives a mahogany brown color. And uh, further, if we apply the sulfuric acid on that, it gives a blue color if the iodine is present. Sorry, if the amyloid is present and microscopically, we have a uh, list of the stains which can be used. When we apply the Congo red, it gives a red pink or the salmon pink color in the light microscopy and it gives an apple green by refrigerants in the uh, polarized microscopy. Thioflavin T and uh, S, it gives uh, fluorescence in the ultraviolet light. Methyl and the crystal violet, it gives a rose pink color. Elgin blue gives a blue green color. PAs gives a pink color and immunohistochemistry, we use it to demonstrate different types of the amyloid. So that finishes uh, amyloidosis. Thank you friends. Thank you for listening patiently.